Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning here, this beautiful Sunday morning. Just the wind just blew all those clouds away and the sun is shining all pretty and beautiful. It's nice and cool out there, not bitterly cold. What a wonderful fall time we're having right now. Thank you for those that are following with us on Facebook today. We welcome you to worship. Um, Just quickly looking ahead, um, let's see. Today we're having our Bible study on the gospel lesson today at 11.15. Um, Wednesday night, the book of John Bible study. Um, Thursday, let's see, the 10th is church council. 17th is uh, patient endurance um, in the fireside room for those who want to come. And for the ladies, um, again, the 17th at at, uh, 6.30 p.m., patient endurance. And um, October food share, or correction, that's November food share, um, at 11.30 to 12.30. We still have plenty of bags, so there will be no packing um, for the November food share. Okay, let's see. The next slide is, yes, fall friends, treats and coffee, freshly baked from our home to you. Whoever else has baked as well, maybe. But... um, The pumpkin bread is out of this world, so slather, if we have butter, slather butter on it. It's really good. And the apple crisp is even just as good. Apple pear, is that what it is? Apple pear. Apple pear. It's yummy. Okay. And let's see. Okay. So uh, we have the shoebox Christmas child. Um, Yes, we have, I can't read that top part. Operation Christmas child, yes. Fill a shoebox and return it to the church by the 17th. That's through Samaritan's Purse. Okay? So if you don't have a shoebox, we have them here, I believe. Does anybody know where they are? Sam, do you know where they are? Well, we have, they're in the office. Okay. We'll get those out and make those available right at the church. Okay. Thank you. All right. And let's see what's next on the agenda. You're invited to Christmas decorating with the Esther Circle December 1st at 10 a.m. Um, refreshments are here as well. So there's a motivation to come help. Because I know when the Esther Circle get together and they're going to have refreshments, it's yummy stuff. Okay, so um, what's next here on the list? Christmas cookie baking, December 7th through 9th, starting each day at 8 a.m. Right downstairs. So please come and help bake cookies. Um, we we're, we're do this for a fundraiser for the church. And, um, and people love our cookies. They always call and say, hey, you have cookies this year? So, um, yes, we do. So we're making a bunch. So come and help September, December 9th, 7 through 9. Okay. All right, what's next? What do we got? Time to fill the mitten tree. So the mitten tree is going to be going up. We collect mittens and hats for the Piedmont Elementary School through January. And a lot of kids, since I've been here, I've heard, they come to school with no mittens and no hats. Some of them don't come to school with shoes sometimes, even in the wintertime. That's pretty harsh. So um, as the Lord leads you, bring a bunch of mittens and hats for the kids across the street. They will definitely feel the warmth of your heart on their bodies. Okay? All right. All right, let's see what's next here. All right. In your bulletin, I mean, in your bulletin, you'll see an insert. And today, more than 360 million Christians experience extreme persecution for following Jesus. That's one in seven believers worldwide. In many places, Christians face violence, imprisonment, even death, um, sometimes even from their own families. Um, But throughout history, persecution has never stopped the church. It makes it stronger. And today is, today is the International Day of Prayer for Persecuted Christians. So let's check out this short video to learn how we can pray for these dear brothers and sisters. Jesus, 
My name is Brian, and I've traveled all over the world to meet with persecuted believers living in some of the most dangerous countries on earth. Through my times, I've shared meals with believers, we've laughed, we've had coffee and tea, we've also cried together, worshiped together, and most importantly, we've prayed for one another. Give him joy and give him a witness to God for your, for your gospel and for the life as well. Give him favor and blessing. Keep him strong. And as he prays to you, I pray you allow him to be a completely devoted disciple of Jesus Christ no matter what challenges he faces. When I speak with these believers, they're not asking for persecution to end, but they ask for things like endurance, for courage, for faith and hope. And more than anything, they want to know that they're not alone and that the worldwide body of Christ is standing with them through prayer. And Father, I pray that you would continue to bless their ministry, bless the, the community here, dear God, that to see more and more people come to know you and become deeper followers, dear God, and have a different relationship with you, Jesus. God, thank you so much for Margaret. I thank you for this, this impactful faith to endure persecution, to be faithful to you, to continue to share the gospel, even with great opposition. God is the God that is one church and one family to follow you with, with fullness through your spirit. In Jesus' name. It's humbling to stand with these suffering believers and they know that they have risked so much for the faith. And there's so much we can learn from them. I want to encourage you to step into the stories of your persecuted family. And the first step you can take is to download the Open Doors Prayer app. The app is updated every day with urgent requests for believers around the world. You might not be able to visit your persecuted family, but through your prayers, you can let them know they're never alone. So in your bulletin, you'll find the insert with some specific prayer requests from Christians featured in this video. This will help you pray for people like Pastor Adolf from Indonesia, the first man in the video, who's personally discipled over 800 Christians from a Muslim background in the most populous Muslim country in the world. As you can imagine, he and his group regularly face um, extreme opposition. Um, we can also pray for Margaret in Ethiopia, the last man in the video, who gave Brian a big bear hug. Margaret put his faith in Christ when everyone in his village was following an animist tradition. His steadfast determination in the face of intense violence and opposition is really inspiring, and he needs our prayers. If you want to make prayer, if you want to make prayer for your persecuted family part of your regular spiritual life, your, be keep, um, your best step forward is very simple. Download this Open Doors prayer app. It's available for your Apple phone or your Android phone. It's updated daily, like he said, with urgent requests coming from straight from open door field workers in the most dangerous countries for Christians. It's the best way for us to stay connected with our persecuted family and to understand how God is working around the world through his people. This is the best gift that you can give anyone is your prayers. So let's pray together. Let's pray for Pastor Adolph Margaret and others around the world. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Please be with our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering today for your name's sake. Their languages may be different, their homes look different, their food is different, but we're united in our faith in you. Your global church is a beautiful picture of just demonstrating your glory, and we thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. Their faith is deep, and their stories are inspiring. Help them know they're not alone, that we love them and are praying for them. Please be their support and their comfort. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn our hearts and minds into worship and prayer and enter into worship right now. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, send forth your Son to lead home his bride, the church, that with all the company of the redeemed, we may finally enter into his eternal wedding feast. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat>
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, <clears throat> we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. For if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. We confess that we are in bondage to sin, and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, and renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Now, Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all of your sins. As a call of our ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as you're able as we sing um, two hymns this morning, Holy, 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 and Holy Ground.
Amen. Please be seated. I don't know how many of you here today were at uh, Jerry Rita's funeral. But there were angels here during his funeral. Because I heard them singing amongst the crowd. Their voices were pitch perfect. Their voices sounded like all female voices, but they were beautiful. Not, not high-pitched or low-pitched, but it was just an amazing, amazing experience from this viewpoint. Hearing everyone sing, but hearing the angels, um, I believe I heard angels singing. And it's true, when we're here in worship, Hebrews 12 talks about this. Not like the old days, but today, we are in the presence of God, and, and those that are with Him are in His presence. And the angels come and minister to the churches, and they worship God with those that worship God. Um, and it's just a wonderful thing to know that when we're here together in worship, we are standing on holy ground. We are on holy ground because of the fact that we're together and because of the fact that this church is dedicated to the worship of our Lord God and um, that God fills everyone who is a believer here in this church. And that's just a wonderful thing. And now the service of the Lord. Morning. morning. Bless you all. So good to see you today. Our first reading now is from the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. This is the word of the Lord. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father in law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come. I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people and children of Israel out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And now we're going to read the gradual from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts. 
Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. Testament reading today is taken from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, 13 through 17. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do not remember, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by his appearance at his coming. But we ought always to give thanks for you, brothers, beloved of the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Here ends the reading of the New Testament lesson. Please stand as you're able as we ask God to open our eyes to hear his gospel. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus to reach out Say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Today's gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, verses 27 through 40. 
There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second, and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as a wife. And, Je and Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, and even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he called the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well. For they no longer dared to ask him any questions. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks Thank be to thee, O Christ. Please be seated. Today's message is stand firm. Today's message is taken from our New Testament reading from 2 Thessalonians. I think it's, it's very appropriate today that um, we look at this, we look at this uh, letter from, from Paul, the second letter from Paul to the Thessalonians through the church in Thessalonica. And I'm going to be reading through the, and, and speaking through the, the whole of chapter 2, which is chapter 2, 1 through 17 there, because to get the context of what he's talking about and understanding what he had spoke to them before in his first letter, and remember that he actually was there and, and planted this church um, and appointed um, you know, elders and deacons there as well. So in the beginning, um, Jesus heard from them that, that they were being told that there was no resurrection, that, that there was the, the day of the Lord had come and gone. So they were beside themselves in thinking that they had missed it. And so he, he tells them not to be quickly shaken in your mind. Okay? So that's like when something happens to you that's tragic or you're in an accident or something like that. You know, you're all shook up, you know. You're shaken. That's what he's talking about. You know, could you imagine, you know, that someone comes and says to you, well, there's no resurrection. You'll never see your family members again. Um, you know, the day of the Lord's come and gone. And that's about it. Well, yeah, it would be alarming. It would be alarming. And he says to them, nor be alarmed whether by a spirit or a word or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So a spirit, a spirit could, could have told to them like when somebody was prophesying or giving a word to the congregation or they received some anonymous letter saying this. So just so you understand that this is what's happening in Thessalonica. <clears throat> Paul goes on to tell them, let no one in any way deceive you. Do not be deceived in any way. Don't even open yourself up to what you don't know is true. And he says, for it, the day of the Lord, has not come unless the apostasy, or in this, or in the ESV, the rebellion, comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, or the son of perdition. For those of you that don't know, apostasy means to rise up in open defiance of authority with a presumed intention to overthrow it or to act in complete opposition to its demands, 
to rebel against, to revolt, to engage in insurrection and rebellion against God and His Word. Now, this is what he's talking about here. So, beloved, I know that you can see this going on in our world today, and especially in, in our nation, where people are, are rebelling against God, they're hating God, and they're coming against His Word. They're standing and rebelling against His Word. I've seen videos where people will knock a Bible out of a person's hand, throw it on the ground, and set it afire. Right? They are, are hateful and engaged in this type of rebellion against God and His Word. So what Paul is saying, that the day of the Lord has not come because a complete rebellion or revolt, or revolt from God and His Word will only occur shortly before the second coming of the Messiah, Jesus. So this will not occur until shortly before Jesus comes back. And then it says, The son of perdition is the one who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God. So you can imagine however many gods there are in Hinduism, how many gods there are in Buddhism, and all the rest of the religions in the world. And this man of lawlessness will set himself above all of those so-called gods and even objects of worship. That means like idols that people place in front of them and worship. And then, to top it off, it says, so that, so he does that in order to take his seat in the sanctuary of God, exhibiting himself as being God. So he's making that claim throughout the whole world. And Paul goes on to say, Do you, don't you remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things. So he's trying to remind them, trying to, to bring them back down to earth, back down to reality, back down to the promises of God and his word. And then he goes on to say, but you know what restrains him now? So that in his time, he will be revealed. In other words, so that in his time, he will be revealed. In other words, the man of lawlessness will be revealed. So there is something restraining the man of lawlessness. And then we go on to see in verse 7 that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So there's something that restrains the man of lawlessness. And there is someone who restrains the man of lawlessness. There are two things. So what Paul is saying is going, is going to look like the world subsequent to law and order. What's going to occur is the world after law and order. Lawlessness is heightened. It was starting to heighten in Paul's day. And he says, so it's already at work. Lawlessness is already at work. You can see it. It's on the news. Every single day something happens. Lawlessness, people, people gluing their heads to priceless art in museums and, you know, destroying them with, with, with you know, um, stuff and, and just marring them and destroying them. Those, those, and nobody does anything about it. That's lawlessness. Lawlessness is limited by God because of law, order, and rulers of government. The what, okay? That's what's restraining the man of lawlessness now. Law, order, and rulers of government. However, I believe a mighty archangel is currently restraining the man until God removes the archangel from his position over the man of lawlessness. So we see law, order, and rulers of governments and a mighty angel restraining the man of lawlessness and what he's going to do. And in verse 8 it says, and when that lawless one will be revealed, like in Revelation 13, 1, then I saw a beast come up out of the sea having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And then it says, continuing in verse 8, whom the Lord Jesus will slay with the breath of his mouth 
and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. But we know as we studied in our Revelation study last year, in Revelation 13, 5, the man of lawlessness is very, very close to, and I believe is, the beast. In Revelation 13, 5, there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who, was, who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. Now we see that the, that the man of lawlessness is given a mouth. He's given a platform, the ability to speak a voice. And his voice is haughty. His speech is that which oversteps the realms of, of a created being. He's proud and presumptuous. His speech is full of arrogance and derogatory to the majesty of God. His blasphemous words slander detract and are injurious, injurious to God's good name. He's, his speech is impious and reproachful and injurious to the divine majesty itself. And it is, he is allowed, he's supplied, he's furnished, he's given everything necessary to make his move. And he's been given authority. He's been per given permission from Satan, first off, to do what he pleases. And he's, he's able to do this for 42 months, with, which is a metaphor of three and a half years. So it's going to be a certain time period, not necessarily literally three and a half years. So he opens his mouth with this derogatory, filthy, disrespectful words against God and his kingdom. And he is also given, supplied, furnished, everything he's needed that's necessary for him to do what he's going to do. And he is given the final authority. Permission by God over every tribe and people and language and nation. The beast will be worshipped by everyone except the elect of God, those sealed by God. And then it says, let him hear. That means it's imperative that you pay attention. He's telling the Thessalonians, he's telling the Thessalonians to listen very carefully. It's an imperative. It's a command that you pay attention to the following words. Those who are destined for captivity must accept being a prisoner as a means of grace. So as we pray for these people that are being persecuted all over the world, their persecution, their captivity, even their death is a means of grace to them. And, and when it talks about those that kill, it's a warning to, for Christians not to resist force with force. And with that, he's saying, here is the perseverance. In other words, here is the ability to not swerve from the deliberate purpose and loyalty to the faith that we have and the piety that we live amidst even great trials and sufferings. And this faith is that strong conviction and belief that God exists and is the creator and ruler of all things, the provider and bestower of eternal salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the Messiah through whom we receive eternal salvation and the kingdom of God. So I have to continue with verses 9 through 12. And so he continues that the man of lawlessness whose coming is in accord with the working of Satan so Satan empowers this man of lawlessness with all power and signs and wonders and with all the deception of unrighteousness. So all of his signs, all the power, all the false wonders are with the deception of unrighteousness. That means all the signs and wonders that he is going to, to show and all the power that he has 
will all be under the auspices of being unrighteous, sinful, lawless things. And it says, these signs and false wonders with the deception of unrighteousness is for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. The elect will not, will not buy into that. They're going to be highly persecuted. And then he says in verse 11, For this reason, God sends upon them, those who perish, those that are following the man of lawlessness, a deluding influence. Or it says, it's in the plural, God sends upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. That's already happening, folks. The lawlessness, the mystery of lawlessness is not a mystery. It's what we see is the purpose of lawlessness unfolding. We see what is false now, today, in our country and around the world. What used to be right and moral and good is now wrong. Here's an example of a deluding influence that God will send upon those who are going to perish in 1 Kings 20, 20-23. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab so that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? So this is in, in, in heaven, God's throne, and his angels are all around him, ministering to him. And then one, and then he's asking these this this council of angels that he's with there. You know, who will entice Ahab? Then one said one thing and another said another until a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord says, I'll entice him. How, the Lord asked. He replied, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then the Lord said, you are to entice him. You shall succeed. Go out and do it. So you see, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all your prophets. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. That's how God's going to do it. That's how God's going to do it to those who are perishing. Who, for those who, who have decided they were going to hate God, stand against Him and revolt against Him. And, and then, he says, he says that and for this reason, God sends upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that, and the result will be that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in unrighteousness. So, now in contrast to the son of destruction and those who are perishing, Paul says, but we ought to thank God for you always. Brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. In the ESV it says first fruits. In the ESV it says that um, in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, it says here in verse 13, um, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Well, it's kind of like, this is really, really frustrating for pastors and scholars and stuff like that because, you know, some translations committee will translate it first fruits and the others will translate it because from the beginning God has chose you for salvation. But to understand, I think, in this context and in the context where Paul talks about the Thessalonians being chosen, okay, by God, um, saying that they're first fruits for salvation is against the context. But anyway, first fruits means that they're first and the best part of the harvest of crops or processed produce or animals or firstborn sons. First fruits also refers to ceremonies in relation to the initial portion of the harvest. So if you're if you want to go with the ESV translation, Paul is saying that you are the first fruits of the Thessalonians you know, the Thessalonians that have come to Christ, okay, for salvation. 
It says, you know, that he chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Okay? So, so the first fruits are those who may have come to Christ first in that part of the country. But I think that it's talking about it in, in context with the other, other verses in Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians. That he's saying from the beginning God chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit. In other words, when God chooses you, he has set you apart for salvation. And then he enables you to believe the truth. And Paul's saying it was for this, in other words, for your salvation. He called you through our gospel. The word of the gospel is what brings us salvation. The word of the gospel is what gives you absolution, is what forgives you forgiveness of sins. That's the word of the gospel. And then Paul says that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the glory which God will bestow upon you, the exalted state of glorified perfection of those who, who dwell with God in heaven. So then, brothers, he says, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or mouth or by letter from us. So he's saying, don't listen to all this other baloney out there because if I'm going to send you a letter, I'm going to sign my name to it and you'll know my writing. And if I'm here, you'll know who I am and I'm not going to vary from what I taught you at the first. So when he says stand firm, he means to persevere, to continue in a state of perseverance. When he says hold, hold to retain, that was the, that's what that means, to retain, to keep following the apostolic teachings or traditions. And the traditions are the only traditions that we are to hold to which are the apostolic traditions found in the Bible, God's Word, for us today. Okay? This, what we have, is what the apostles handed down to us. The Word of Salvation and no other tradition must determine the teaching or practice of the church. Only what the apostles themselves handed down, not the traditions of men. And then he gives them a benediction. He gives them a blessing. And he says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. And so, beloved, we have to stand firm. And we have to come and join into the fellowship of the eager and unashamed. I invite you to the fellowship of the eager and unashamed who stand firm in the gospel and so declare by the grace of God with full reliance upon the power and presence of the Spirit of God and compelled by the love of Christ. I invite and challenge every believer here, every believer there on Facebook to join the fellowship, the gospel fellowship of those who stand firm in the gospel eager and unashamed to proclaim it. The die has been cast. Step over the line. The decision has been made. Be a follower and disciple of Christ. Don't look back. Don't let up. Don't slow down. Don't back away. Be still and know your Savior. Nor will you be silenced. Your past is redeemed. Your present is ordered and your future is assured. Be finished and done with low living, sight walking, diminished vision, smooth knees, and colorless dreams. Be done with resentful giving and dwarfed goals. You no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. You now desire by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, directed by the Word of God, motivated by the love of Christ, committed to persistent prayer, and joyfully desiring the glory of God. You now, by God's grace, have so declared my pace is set. My stride is steady. My destination is a new heaven and a new earth. The path is narrow. The way is rough. My companions may be few, but my captain is infallible. My mission is clear. My message is glorious. You cannot buy me, compromise me, deter me, lure me away or turn me back, dilute me, distract me, or delay me. If my God is with me and lays hold of me, I will not flinch by his grace in the face of sacrifice, 
hesitate by threats of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemies of God, gaze upon the pool of popularity or wander into the life maze of mediocrity. Yes, by God's grace, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I will go until he returns. Give until I'm poured out. Preach his word and labor while it's still today. And when he comes to get his own, by God's grace, he will have no problem in recognizing me as one with whom he purchased, belonging to him. My armor will be on, the weapons of the spirit are drawn, and Christ as my banner will be flagged, willingly a fool for Christ. Let this be your invitation this morning. In Jesus' name. Here, a pin drop. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Can we sing song drop? Yeah. We don't have the words, though, do we? If you're in the, in the, uh, <clears throat> turn in your blue candle to page 526. This song drop. 526. Church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, 
and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the church to come. Amen. Please be seated. In the back of your bulletin, we have we have a, a list of people that have health needs. And Father, are, and that are in the hospital now. Uh, Judy Stockton is in the hospital now, and um, Darlene Saff is across the street at uh, Viewcrest doing her new pound. Mary Jenny is in the facility as well. Lawrence Kubiak. Let's pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, faithful God, we commend ourselves and our bodies and souls and all things into your keeping. In your righteousness, deliver us from all that would harm the body and assault the soul. Heavenly Father, we know of your deep love for us. You've called us your children. Deepen the love of your children for their parents and parents for their children. Strengthen fathers and mothers in their vocations that they may raise their children in the way that they should go. Hear the prayers of those who long for families. Sustain all expectant mothers and their little ones. O oh God, you are, you are our rock and our fortress in our distress. Hear our prayers for those who are sick, those that are on our list of names that we mentioned, those that are suffering, those that are recovering from illness, um, our secretary's husband, Steve Morgan, and um, Gary Lofold, who had surgery as well, God, or injury, anybody who's injured themselves. Um, Father, we pray for them right now. Thank you, Father, for all, for, for that all who are nourished by the holy body and blood of your Son will be raised to immorality, immortality and incorruption to be seated with him at your heavenly banquet. Eternal Father, though death still claims our mortal bodies, you have raised up Christ that we may pass through death to our own joyful resurrection and to the great reunion with those who have died in Christ and now rest from their labors. Receive our thanks for, for all the saints and for their witness and bear on and hear us on behalf of those who mourn the loss of those they love, especially the family recently of Jerry Guido. Bring us at last, to the place of everlasting life and life, that we may see you face to face and live in your presence forevermore. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> two lines, one on your right and one on your left. Um, as I'm looking, it'll be on your right and your left. Okay, two, two lines. As you come up, proceed around to the end of the rail, okay? And come to the center. Alright? Okay? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. That's right. Thanks and praise.
Let's pray together. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son to our flesh to bear our sin and to be our Savior. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness of sin, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Now graciously receive our prayer, deliver and preserve us, and to you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This is in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, and your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Together. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace.
Savior Jesus Christ and give him for you. It's the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and give him for you. It's the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and give him for you. It's the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and give him for you. It's the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and give him for you. Savior Jesus Christ shed for you. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you body and soul from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you, body and soul, from this time forth and forever. Amen. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you, body and soul, and preserve you from this day forth and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray together. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift 
And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Receive the benediction this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, his favor upon you, and give you his peace, that peace which passes all of your understanding. And you're going out and you're coming in, and you're lying down and you're rising up from this day forth and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as you're able as we sing to God be the glory. And for those of you that want the boxes for Operation um, Christmas, they're right there at the back of the narthex, right underneath the picture of Jesus. To God be the glory. Thank you.